All right, welcome everyone to Vaccination Decisions, Recruiting for Clinical Trials. My name is Emily Hostetler, my pronouns are she, her. I am a part of the community engagement team at the Museum of Science and I'll be moderating our conversation today. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Let's begin with some logistics. If you'd like to see captions, please click on the closed caption button and select show subtitle. We will keep all participants' audio and videos off for the duration of the panel discussion. If you would like to submit a question for our panel, click the chat button and send in your questions to Susan. Please note that if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, we cannot see your comments. After the panel, those of you joining on Zoom will have the opportunity to move into small breakout conversations to dive a little deeper into what is discussed during the panel. If you choose to stay for those conversations, we will offer you a $25 e-gift card as an appreciation of your time with us. I would like to take a moment now just to thank the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson for supporting the museum's COVID-19 initiatives and upcoming ex exhibition. I'm now going to turn it over to our museum president, Tim Ritchie, who would like to welcome all of you here tonight. Thank you, Emily, and it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's town hall. I'm Tim Ritchie, the president of the museum, as Emily said, and I'm really glad you're here for this important conversation. And I have a question for you. Have you ever seen a moment where science has been more public and more participatory than it is right now? Every person who decides to wear a mask is entering into a public participation in science. Everyone who decides not to is choosing not to participate. At the Museum of Science, we want to be a place that facilitates public participation in science. We believe that the more the public participates, the more it will learn to love science, the more it will learn to tr trust science. Tonight's subject is fundamentally about public participation in science. The only way we move science forward is to understand how things work. And in medicine, clinical trials are the most rigorous way of doing that. But let's be clear. Clinical trials require human volunteers. They require an act of self-sacrifice. And without those volunteers, without that sacrifice, there would be no vaccines. There would be no cancer therapies. There would be no new treatments for the things that bedevil humanity. But the development of vaccines and medicines raises in giant ethical questions as well about diversity and about representation, about so many things. In the case of the vaccines for COVID-19, there was an outpouring and continues to be an outpouring of candidates wanting to test the vaccine. And more volunteers will be needed all the time to test the vaccine safety and efficacy in populations such as children and pregnant women. Tonight, our panelists will explore the issues surrounding clinical trials for vaccines. And then you will have a chance both to ask your questions and if you choose to stay in the small groups to discuss your concerns, your questions, your voice, your concerns, they matter. So I hope you will be able to stay. And thanks again, back to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Tim. I would now like to introduce all of our panelists for this evening. Panelists, when I say your name, please turn on your video and you can give a wave hello if you'd like. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Dan Baruch. Dr. Baruch received his PhD in immunology from Oxford University and his MD from our Harvard Medical School. He is currently a professor of medicine and immunology at Harvard Medical School, director of the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a member of the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard, and part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Collaboration for AIDS Vaccine Discovery. His laboratory has applied their vaccine expertise to preclinical and clinical studies of infectious diseases such as Zika virus, tuberculosis, and most importantly, COVID-19. Welcome to Dr. Baruch. Thank you. Thanks, Next, Emily. Good to be here. Thank you. I would also like to introduce Nainikwa Blandine, who is Vice President of Health Resources in Action, where she oversees the growth of biomedical research grant making through the Medical Foundation, as well as community health grant making in partnership with healthcare, governmental, and community-based clients. Ms. Blandine previously served as the Director of Health and Wellness at the Boston Foundation, where she oversaw the development, implementation, and evaluation of one of the foundation's strategic priorities to address the health needs of the people of Greater Boston, with a special focus on low-income people of color. Welcome, Naniqua. 
Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And the next person I would like to introduce, and I welcome you to come on screen, uh, Dr. Webb Hooper. I know you're having some technical difficulties, but we were happy to have you here. We have Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Great. Hello. Um, she is Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She oversees all aspects of the Minority Health and Health Disparities Institute and supports the implementation of the science visioning recommendations to improve minority health, reduce health disparities, and promote health equity. As a translational behavioral scientist and clinical health psychologist, Dr. Webb Hooper has dedicated her career to the scientific study of minority health and racial ethnic disparities, focusing on chronic illness, illness prevention and health behavior change. Welcome to Dr. Webb Hooper. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you all so much for being here. We're so excited to hear from you and I can't wait to hear what we talk about this evening. So we've discussed how uh, we've asked our participants at, uh, who signed up today to send us some questions when they signed up for the event. And I think there's one question we could start with to get us going. Dr. Baruch, I believe you perhaps can start us off on an answer for this sort of three-part question. What are clinical trials? How are they conducted? And what do we even learn from them? Sure, so clinical trials are basically the study of new experimental drugs, vaccines, uh, therapeutics, or other tools, medical tools in human beings. Essentially, they need to be studied and they need to be proven to be safe and effective before they can be approved by the FDA and then rolled out to the general public because we would not want to have any product rolling out to the general public if it is not safe or if it is not effective. So clinical trials are the critical studies that allow new medications, new drugs, new vaccines, new devices to be approved. For vaccines in particular, there are typically three phases of clinical trials. And for COVID-19, some of them have been truncated um, or rather combined. The first phase called phase one studies are typically small clinical trials and maybe a couple dozen people, really just to show safety. Phase two trials are larger trials, typically in hundreds of patients to show expanded safety, as well as to determine what the best doses are for move, and the best regimens are for moving forward. And if, the, if those data look good, then the definitive trials are called phase three trials. And for vaccines, those are the trials that actually determine whether the vaccine is effective at preventing COVID-19 disease or not. And uh, those studies are typically very large, thousands, or in the case of COVID-19, tens of thousands of participants. Uh, and in those trials, it's of critical importance to have a um, a geographic, a racial, an ethnic, a socioeconomic mixture that represents the populations at risk, uh, both in the United States and throughout the world, uh, because those are the trials that determine whether the intervention, in this case, COVID-19 vaccine, is actually safe and is actually effective. And so they have to be tested in the right populations. And then with those data, then those data go before the regulatory agencies in the United States, it's the US FDA to uh, review and then to determine whether those data are sufficient to warrant approval. Thank you so much for that comprehensive answer. I really appreciate it. Um, we had one question come in from the audience that is sort of related to this that I would like to ask. Um, they say, my understanding is that trials were or are with generally with healthy people. How are the effects of the vaccines being tracked for others who are receiving the vaccine now that don't have the same health baselines? So the, um, The patients or the participants who are included in clinical trials changes over time. In the earliest phase one studies, typically they only recruit healthy people because you wanna make sure that the vaccine is very safe and healthy people before it's expanded. By the time there is phase three trials, then it's a quite broad inclusion criteria. So many people with illnesses, with chronic illnesses are allowed in the phase three trials. Typically, there's no age limit either uh, above a certain age in, in the typically age 16 or 18, but there's no age restriction. And, and most 
medical conditions are allowed. There are some conditions that were excluded from most of the phase three trials, uh, such as uh, pregnant women generally were not allowed in the phase three trials, patients with uh, immunosuppressive disorders or therapies, um, such as rheumatic disease, cancers, generally were not in the phase three trials. And so the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines in those populations are typically uh, evaluated uh, after initial approval. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now I, you touched on this a little bit and I'm sorry to, to harp on you so much, Dr. Brook, but I just wanna get these kind of science focused questions out of the way. Um, so one thing that a lot of people have talked about was that the COVID vaccine was developed quickly, maybe too quickly. And some people are nervous to get the vaccine because of that expedited timeline. Could you talk a little bit about how the COVID-19 vaccine was tested? And maybe we can even start talking a little bit about who was included in those tests in those clinical trials trials and does that represent um, the United States or the people who should be um, receiving the vaccine? Sure, absolutely. So the development of not one but multiple COVID-19 vaccines in approximately a year is, is really an amazing uh, triumph of science. And it is true these vaccines were developed quickly, but I would say they were developed efficiently rather than being rushed. They were not rushed. There was not a single corner cut. In fact, they were subject to more scrutiny, public scrutiny, scientific scrutiny, medical scrutiny than any other vaccines in, a, in development, in my opinion. The trials were larger and more comprehensive than most other vaccine trials. For example, the COVID-19 vaccine trials in the United States generally were between 30,000 and 45,000 people representing broad swaths of the country uh, and in some cases the world, with particular emphasis and, and really top priority in enrolling um, uh, racial and ethnic minorities because those are populations at increased risk of the disease and severe outcomes. And so absolutely have to be included in clinical trials for public trust, as well as for uh, national and global benefit. So with particular emphasis on trying to enroll diverse patient populations different ages, different genders, uh, different uh, baseline health conditions, different uh, socioeconomic uh, status, so racial minorities, ethnic minorities, really a huge emphasis on participation of different uh, populations. Um, the, the vaccine trials were, were huge. In many cases, vaccines are licensed based on trials of several thousand participants. Here we have trials of 30 to 45,000 participants. So the total safety database in terms of person years is actually much higher than in most cases for vaccines. So it is true the vaccines were developed quickly, but uh, again, I would call it efficiently with no corners being cut whatsoever. And in fact, probably a stronger safety database than for vaccines that take 10 times as long to develop. Great, thank you so much. Um, now, uh, Dr. Webb Hooper or Naniqua, are you able to touch a little bit on, you know, why it's so important to make sure that you have a broad swath, as uh, Dr. Brook says, of people in these clinical trials? I can start. I think that um, I think that he covered it very well in terms of the reasons that it's important. In general, we want research, clinical trials, and other types of research to represent the population. We want to make sure that the findings, what we learn from that research is applicable across all populations. And in this case, you know, as he mentioned, it's particularly important because of the communities who are disproportionately affected and facing this sort of undue burden. And I'd like to point out that the, the reason that certain communities, particularly racial ethnic minorities or underserved populations are at higher risk is not because of a sort of biological reason. Um, so that's not the reason that it's important. Although the studies, Moderna, Pfizer, and I'm sure the, the studies that are, you know, we'll soon we'll know all of the findings, did look at subgroup, they did conduct subgroup analyses and found that the vaccines work quite effectively at the same rate with no difference across populations. But that for me is less of the reason why it's important. It's more about the public trust. We knew in this case, that with all of the discussion and all of the sort of national recognition 
about health inequities, about health disparities, and about you know, the disproportionate impact that people would ask and people would wonder and people would uh, you know, have skepticism and they would say, are there people in the trials who are, you know, who identify with groups that I identify with? And so it's important to be able to, to tell them the extent to which that happened. And in this case, um, you know, when you look at the Moderna trial and you look at the, um, the Pfizer trial, we know that in Moderna's trial, about 10% of the sample um, identified as Black or African-American, about 20% identified as Hispanic Latino. So these numbers are much higher than the typical clinical trial. I think the lack of representation of racial and ethnic minoritized communities has been low. And we know that it's something that, that we're working towards in, as a scientific community to try to address. And in this case, we knew that it was important to really push that and to, to demonstrate that we can do better as it relates to inclusion in these trials. And I think there's still work to do, but I think part of the reason is, is the short answer is for the public confidence that these vaccinations will be effective for, for everyone. Thank you. And just adding to um, those really important points that um, were, were just lifted up, um, I, I'd just like to reiterate um, the point um, that was lifted up regarding um, th that it's not genetic risk factors um, among Black and um, other communities of color um, that is really driving these differences. Much of the work that I am involved in uh, locally here in Massachusetts and across the country through our organization at Health Resources in Action um, is really working at the intersect of the social determinants of health and, and, and race and thinking through like what are the inequities that exist, what are the injustices at the systemic level that are really getting in the way of um, communities um, fully thriving and fully attaining uh, their best health. And in this case, COVID-19 has really laid to bear many of the long-standing health inequities that existed in this country. And so it is important for us as we are addressing, um, you know, this, this public health, um, you know, crisis across our country is for us to um, really ensure that we are engaging all individuals that are impacted um, by the pandemic. And um, so to building on the, 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 the really important point around trust, um, I think it's, it's important as we um, consider ways to ensure that we are fully engaging um, everyone um, you know, in, in this country that are, that's impacted, that we are doing our outreach and doing the, the, taking the steps to really um, ensure that um, folks are represented um, appropriately. And I think I just want to applaud all of the scientific work um, that has been done to date uh, to really get us to a place where we now have not one, but multiple uh, vaccines. Um, and I just, the, the data is incredible in that we are engaging more than 30 some odd thousand individuals. Um, but I also like to um, recognize that there is more work to be done. And I think that this is an exciting time for us to really consider consider not just in clinical trials, but across all of our sectors, how might we shift to really be responsive and continue to, um, to, to, to do the great work that's been done um, so far. Go ahead. If I can really add to that, then I can say that um, uh, for all of the large vaccine trials, uh, in the US there are really five. Uh, uh, Moderna, um, Pfizer, J&J, &J, uh, AstraZeneca, Novavax. Some reported, some uh, soon to be reported. The, the, the emphasis on enrolling a diverse participant population has been at the absolute top priority of the trials. Uh, from the companies, from the NIH, from the site investigators, from the local clinical trial sites, in many cases, with um, a diverse set of clinical investigators enrolling people, um, uh, because not only do the vaccines need to be tested and demonstrated to be effective in these different populations, but also uh, one of the most important ways to build trust is to include a diverse participant population from the start of clinical research. And uh, and and that, that is really essential for ultimate acceptance of the vaccine because 
a vaccine that's safe and effective that is not trusted fails. It fails in its mission to be deployed and fails in its mission to stop the pandemic. And the goal is not just to get a vaccine approved. The goal is to actually have it deployed and trusted by uh, the entire population so it can stop the pandemic. Uh, so, so, so I think that uh, the, the early participation of uh, wide diversity of participants and investigators is, is actually uh, a critical because unlike a medication that is often prescribed by a doctor uh, as a drug, then a vaccine is different. A vaccine really needs public trust, perhaps even more so than a medication for when somebody is sick with a disease. And because of the need for public trust, then uh, community outreach, community engagement, and enrollment of a wide diversity of uh, participants in the clinical trial process is, is really critical. And, and th there's been a huge effort in trying to do so for all of the vaccines that are being tested, at least in the United States. Thank you so much, all of you, for touching on that. Um, we do have a question from our viewers that is kind of a good follow-up for all of this, which is, how do we uh, get clinical trial participants? How do you become enrolled in a clinical trial? So I'm just wondering a little bit, how do we really recruit folks to participate in these clinical trials? How do we bridge that gap to, um, you know, have people become enrolled and bridge that gap of trust? How do we, how do we get there, <laughs> I guess is my question. I can speak a little bit about that to start. Um, so I'm a clinical researcher. Before I joined NIH, I was a clinical researcher for, for many years. And, you know, you, it depends on the, the setting. So if you are, you know, working in a hospital setting or in a medical clinic, many times patients are recruited by the research nurses um, and the physicians who might present the opportunity to participate in a trial to a patient who may be eligible. Um, if you are in the community, you may, may learn about trials in a number of ways. Sometimes it's television. Sometimes it's the radio or newspaper advertisements. Social media certainly is one way that we've, we've advertised. And a huge, huge source of referrals and recruitment into clinical trials is word of mouth. And that's where the trust component really comes into play. And most of my work in communities who were generally minoritized communities and low income communities, word of mouth was essential. Knowing someone else who either recommended the participation opportunity or you know, reported that they had a good experience. And in the case of the uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials, the Coronavirus Prevention Network, um, or COVPN, is uh, one source of recruitment for these trials. And you know, when this website for the Coronavirus Prevention Network was released, within you know, 24 hours, there were close to 100,000 individuals who would raise their hand to say that I'm interested in participating in a vaccine trial. Um, and so that was one way where you could access the website um, or eventually a telephone number as well. And you would enter information about yourself and then you'd receive a call back from, the, from, the, uh, from someone to screen you and, and verify that you are eligible to participate. Um, and then each of the vaccine trial companies also had their own website where one could review the informed consent, understand the details of the trial, and then um, fill out the online screening opportunity, and then they also would receive a callback. So there are a number of ways in which one can be referred. I think hearing from one's doctor, hearing from one's trusted physician or medical provider is a key way that many people would consider participating in a trial and a great opportunity for them to learn about, about clinical trials of, of all kinds. Thank you so much. Um, so speaking of clinical trial experience, have any of you participated in a clinical trial or know someone who has and would like to share what that experience is like with us? I, I could start there as well. So uh, I have uh, participated in a clinical trial and um, it was a behavioral trial though. It was a trial for for individuals who wanted to engage in or try a weight management intervention. And I said, oh, I'll try that and see how that, how that experience went. And it was, it was um, I say minimal risk because it was a behavioral trial. So there was no injections or blood draws or anything like that. Well, there were blood draws in that trial actually. 
And it was a, a pleasant experience. I was able to have all of my questions answered. Um, and it was a longitudinal study. So I participated for a period of time and then they tracked me. They followed up over time to see how I was doing. And I wore a Fitbit and all those kinds of things in, in this case. Um, for the vaccine trials, we have an initiative um, at the NIH and it's called SEAL, which is the Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. And so we have funded state-based um, teams who form this alliance across 11 states and soon to add more states to the SEAL Alliance. And one of the objectives of SEAL is to provide education around clinical trials to answer the very questions that you're asking, Emily, or that the audience is asking about what is a trial, how might I participate, what are the risks, will I be kept safe? And so the research teams who have deep ties within their communities um, are able to disseminate information about trials and facilitate the enrollment in, in this case, COVID-19, a vaccine and therapeutic trials. Um, and I also have uh, parents who are participants in COVID-19 vaccine trials. And um, because I have that experience and my, my, my in-laws actually, both of my in-laws are enrolled in a COVID-19 vaccine trial. And so I wanted to share their perspective to hopefully help other people and conduct an interview with them that's now available on YouTube. Um, and hopefully you'll post the link to it if you haven't already. And you can, you can watch it if you're interested to hear about their experience. These are seniors, these are retired individuals who raised their hand and rolled up their sleeves to participate in the vaccine trials. And they were able to describe what it was like from their, their perspective. And I found their perspective very enlightening for a number of reasons. One of those is because these are older, retired African-Americans. And oftentimes you would get the impression based on the discussion and the literature, the discourse on social media, that African-Americans are not interested in participating in trials and are not interested, would not do so, do not want to be guinea pigs. And that's actually not true. There, is, there are reports of elevated skepticism and hesit hesitancy, which are very well justified given our history and given our experiences that are recent. So not just, histor not just historical, but current experience that folks are having. However, this is a, a diverse group of people with the diverse, diverse perspectives on, on these topics. And so in this interview with my in-laws, they represent a perspective on this that, that might be different and might be surprising for some um, about why they decided to participate, which I will also say was not through my encouragement. They did this on their own. And actually when I learned that they joined the trial, I thought I need to share this story with others because I think, I think some may be surprised. Well, I can go next. And uh, I am a participant in one of the COVID-19 vaccine trials myself. So having been a researcher involving COVID-19 vaccines and helping to design some of these trials, then I uh, decided that I would also be a participant uh, in one of the trials. And um, I think it's a fantastic experience. Uh, nothing but positive things to say about uh, being a participant in these trials. I think it's, uh, in, in a, it's an amazing opportunity for people to contribute to the global, uh, the global fight against the pandemic. Uh, and there's no way that the trials can be done without participation and without participants. And they have to be the right participants. They have to be uh, participants, as I said before, representing, representing the population. And so um, I think um, one of my experiences with being a participant is that it was, um, um, it was initially a little difficult to get in touch with the clinical trial sites because there was such overwhelming demand to participate in these trials. Uh, because um, uh, these trials were conducted essentially at the time of the peak surges. And the demand, <clears throat> the, the number of participants interested was so astronomically high that the clinical trial sites actually could not return phone calls fast enough. And so I do think that uh, many people, thousands of people tried to sign up that could not, that, 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 that were not able to participate just because the clinical sites were just overwhelmed with interest. It's not usually, that, that's not common for clinical trials. Usually there has to be recruiting of clinical trials. 
in, in for the COVID-19 vaccines, there's such incredible demand that it overwhelmed the staffing of the clinical trial sites. And so that's something that I sort of experienced from the other side uh, that, um, uh, that I, I don't think that the clinical trial sites were prepared, nor, is, nor would it have been possible for them to prepare for the, 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 the incredible uh, uh, interest in participants uh, to, to join these studies. But I was fortunate to uh, have the experience of, uh, of being in one of these trials myself. Thank you for that. And I will jump in and say that I have also participated in clinical trials in the past. Um, they have been behavioral, um, very much like Dr. Webb Hooper um, noted. Um, and so I, I remember I was, did participate in a randomized controlled trial and um, it, was, it was very, um, very uh, low risk. Um, however, the, the experience itself was very pleasant. Um, and I think that for me, what it highlighted, I was also a young researcher at the time, um, it, it highlighted for me that the importance of the informed consent process and really ensuring that um, individuals have a, um, you know, a, a, a shared understanding around the expectations um, of the process, um, around the risks involved. And I have to say, um, while I have not participated in the COVID clinical trials, I want to just Take, the mo take a moment to publicly um, acknowledge. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for sharing your, your story, um, as well as Monica, your parents' um, story as well. I have to say, I watched the video and I was very um, uh, moved uh, by your parents' story and energized um, and, and also just, um, uh, it was heartwarming to see um, an, an, an older couple, um, elders um, that represent the Black community um, speak so openly about um, their experience. And I think that is what is needed um, as, as in one of many things in this um, huge puzzle of mitigating um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. But we do need to have public discussions like this around our experiences and, and how we might move forward to continue to support each other in this process. Thanks for watching that, I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. I also encourage everyone to watch the YouTube video of the interview because it is fantastic. So uh, we did post that in the chat if you want to check it out. Um, Dr. Baruch, do you know if you got the placebo or the vaccine yet? I, I don't know. So, um, <laughs> so I, I could have received either one. Time will tell. And Eventually that's, we'll that's part of being in a trial. Right. All right. Sounds good. Um, well, I know, uh, Naniqua, you mentioned a little bit about kind of how informed consent and um, kind of how can we protect people who are participating in clinical trials, right? We did, we have a few questions coming in of just how do we make sure that um, vulnerable and minority groups uh, needs are addressed and met while they participate in a clinical trial? And how do we just make sure that everyone is safe when they participate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I would start, um, but I would love for my um, colleague panelists um, to also join in here. Um, but in order to ensure safety, I mean, I think I would just go back to um, the point that I lifted up earlier around the importance of having a shared understanding, um, not only in the process of the clinical trial itself that um, an individual might be signing up for, but I think it's also important for the, the clinician, um, the team, the individuals who are um, really both designing and um, implementing these initiatives to have a shared understanding around um, some of the barriers, um, some of the um, experiences um, that are unique um, to the communities that are being engaged in this process. So I think it's, it's definitely um, an opportunity to um, ensure again that there's um, shared understanding of all of the information that um, is being um, uh, shared as part of a part of this work. Um, and then also ensuring that the, the team is, is, is that's delivering these services um, are really um, in tune with the experiences of those that are participating. I'd love for um, 
my colleagues as well on this panel to, to chime in. Sure, I can chime in next. So uh, safety is the top priority in these clinical trials. It, it really is the number one priority. And that goes for everyone in the trial, uh, the racial and ethnic minorities, as well as um, uh, everyone else. So safety is the absolute top priority of the study team, the developers, the study physicians, the study nurses. And there is, there is a huge attention to safety. Um, that being said, clinical trials intrinsically means that we don't know everything about the product yet, otherwise they would be approved. So there also has to be a level of honesty and there has to be a very open dialogue that these are experimental products. They could have unknown effects. And that's the purpose of the clinical trial is to determine safety and to determine efficacy. So that being said, there is, um, um, there, there are uh, the study physicians, study nurses that are available to participants essentially 24 seven in the event that anything is untoward or goes wrong. Um, but there's a very strong attention to safety and, um, and um, uh, it, 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 it really is the, the number one, the absolute top priority of, uh, of the study teams is to ensure safety for everyone in the trial. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a specific question here about current COVID clinical trials. Um, this viewer is asking, um, are there clinical trials going on now for children who are under the age of 16? And are there any other clinical trials happening for pregnant women or other folks who you mentioned earlier who were not participants in um, the clinical trials previously for safety reasons? Uh, yeah, so the, the clinical trials for the large clinical trials for adults, um, I believe are completed enrollment. So as I said, there were so far five big ones. Uh, first, the first one was Pfizer, very short, uh, but followed very closely thereafter by Moderna, J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, and Novavax. Um, Many or some of those vaccines have already been proven to be safe and effective in adults. And so the natural extension from that is to test it in pediatric populations as well as in so-called special populations, which includes immunosuppressed individuals, pregnant women, and some of the other groups that we talked about earlier in this conversation. And um, I know that, um, uh, I, I believe that all the vaccine manufacturers have a pediatrics program and uh, those studies are ongoing. And uh, it does take longer to roll out pediatric studies because, uh, because obviously we have to make sure the products are safe and effective in adults before, uh, before they could go into, into children. But there's a lot of emphasis now in age de-escalation. And I think any of the vaccines that are being rolled out for widespread use in the United States and the world are, are in the early phases of an age de-escalation. Uh, I don't believe any of the vaccines are yet in very young children, but the goal is to get there. And it's not completely clear exactly the timing of that. Some of it will be dependent on enrollment and how the vaccines look uh, in, in children. But generally the way pediatric studies are conducted is uh, they're in older individuals such as teenagers and then younger teenagers and then younger and younger children all the, all the way down to babies. So in, in several steps. So it's called age de-escalation. And uh, several of the vaccines are in the early phases of that. So I think that we'll be hearing a lot more in the coming months, in the spring and summer of increasing emphasis on pediatric studies. I believe that there also are ongoing studies in pregnant women now. Great, thank you so much for answering that. We had another question come in from um, the audience that relates back to what we were talking about uh, a little earlier. Maybe you can touch back on some of the points you mentioned, but they ask, how do you convince the BIPOC community to participate in clinical trials, considering the fact that most people who don't trust clinical trials are from those communities? Are there any best practices or things that we should really look to try to do in the future to um, really try to do better? Yes, I can start there and I'm sure um, that my co-panelists will have a lot to say here as well. 
Um, I think, um, especially from the NIH perspective, this experience of this pandemic has inspired a refocus on this issue and on that we, we don't wanna study communities, we wanna serve them and that it is possible to serve them through our science. And so many of the initiatives that the NIH is currently, um, that currently we currently have and things that will be coming, you'll see more of, a, of an emphasis, I think, on community engagement. And what that means is something that many researchers who that may not have been their typical approach or stance to do this, will quickly have to learn what that means. And, and it involves working with trusted voices. So people want to hear from people who they trust. Um, and that might include their own doctor who tends to be the most trusted person, especially about medical advice, which makes sense if that's who they would trust. But there are also other local community voices who are known and trusted. So if someone suggests something to them, they'll be more likely to consider it or listen to it. I think the other thing is that we have to be very honest. Um, I think Dr. Baruch mentioned that we have to be honest about what's happening, what the risks are, so that people can make informed decisions that affect their, the, the, their own health, the health of their family and their communities. We also have to be very real and acknowledge the history that many people are concerned about. So although I mentioned that you know, African-Americans are certainly in other groups, no group is a monolith, um, but there are real concerns that are there. And I've heard more discussion and, and mention of pre previous historical you know, abuses in research such as Tuskegee, but also other um, abuses that have happened that I have in, in the recent past for sure. And so as these sort of historical traumas are brought up and people are talking about it and thinking about it, we have to acknowledge that in a real way, not just, well, we know this happened, but trust us. The other part is I think trustworthiness. So we, we really talk about this in the sense of how do we get people to trust us? My answer is, well, how do you demonstrate that you should be trusted? How do you demonstrate trustworthiness? And that is, is a systems level kind of change that needs to happen. We can't just expect people to be fixed and why don't they trust us until we demonstrate that we should be trusted. I mean, I'm a psychologist by training. I think about this some way in that way, right? So if you have a relationship with someone and they consistently abuse you or you feel like they minimize you, then all of a sudden when they're ready for you to trust them, you probably won't. And they can't expect that you just turn, flip on the light switch and all of a sudden, trust you until you've demonstrated, and it often is a period of time, trust is one of those really fragile and distrust, really fragile kinds of, of emotions and cognitions. It's about one's belief that uh, a person, an institution, a, something has the best in, their best interest in mind. And I think once communities and groups that have been disenfranchised really believe through action that institutions, systems, and policies actually have their best interests in mind, that's when we'll see this, the, I think the tide turn in terms of how do we get people to trust us? Now I will say with that, that we know that trust, trust takes time, but unfortunately in the context of the pandemic, we don't really have time. And I, I say this a lot to, our, um, to the communities that I work with very closely and the people who I love, we don't have time. We, we have to trust in science and we have to find those trusted voices who we believe understand the science and can communicate it to us in a way that we can digest it and understand it because we cannot afford, especially as minoritized communities, to be left behind. We're already facing health disparities and if we, if we do not accept a vaccination and other groups are, we can expect that those disparities will persist and will potentially widen. And it goes beyond health, but you have economic disparities, you may have educational disparities and others that we really have to be concerned about. So it is about moving at the speed of trust, but, but helping communities come along faster. And those trusted voices right now are critical since we don't have time to, to do all the things we should do. And I think this experience with COVID will help. If everything goes well, and I'm confident that it will in terms of the vaccines being safe and effective, it will be a great use case for people to see, oh, okay, that did work out. I was skeptical. I didn't know that I could trust it and it worked out. And that would be a great thing going forward for us to have a really positive example at a critical junction in history to be able to see this happen in real time. I'll add very briefly to that, that I think that uh, uh, starting to engage racial and ethnic minorities in the clinical trial process 
is 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 extremely important because that's really the linchpin uh, to eventually deployment of a vaccine in these communities. And um, uh, I think that some of the efforts to enroll a diverse patient population in the clinical trials are already bearing fruit because um, uh, the, the participation in the clinical trials uh, of um, uh, various uh, racial and ethnic groups has been relatively good. Uh, not as much as we would ideally like, but historically uh, very good compared with uh, prior clinical research. So I think that uh, it's a baby step forward and there's a lot more to do, uh, but I do think that uh, the process of active engagement in clinical trials of a diverse participant population is at least one step forward in that regard. Thank you so much, Dr. Brook and Dr. Webb Hooper. Naniqua, do you have anything to close us out with? <laughs> Thank you, Emily. If I can just share, so I absolutely agree with both um, comments. Um, I, I, you know, much of my work is um, really working across the social determinants of health and really looking at what the systems level um, issues that are really getting in the way of, of people's health. And so I just want to, um, to, to note that um, in addition to building trust, I just, it's important to lift up the work of Dr. Kamar Jones and, and researchers such as um, Dr. David Williams who have really looked at the interconnections between um, structural racism and healthcare. Um, and not only healthcare, but other sectors. And in healthcare, it is important for us to really, um, just as Dr. Webb Hooper pointed out, for us to really um, be honest and open around the systems level issues, the historical abuses that existed um, uh, you know, across communities of color. And we have to be clear that these, these issues still exist today. And so all of our work, while we are looking to ensure that we are engaging a diverse community of, 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 of individuals in these clinical trials, um, as we are ensuring that we are making sure that we have the right information, the accurate information um, to communities so that community members can make informed decisions around um, what steps needs to be taken um, to protect their health. Um, I think it's very important for us to ensure that we um, continue to contextualize the, the barriers that exist um, that um, really um, may make it difficult for people to live healthy lives. And in addition to that, I think it's very important um, for us to um, ensure that we are leveraging um, the, the infrastructure, the supports at the community level that um, are um, integral in helping us to really um, make sure that that information is being delivered um, by trusted individuals, um, individuals who can deliver the information in a way that would be well received. So if I can just sum it up, I would say that, you know, making sure that, again, we have shared shared understanding of the of accurate information um, relative to making informed decisions about our health, but also acknowledging the systems as particularly the, the systemic racism that exists across the different social determinants of health that are getting in the way of individuals being able to, um, uh, to, to thrive. I think that definitely needs to, to be an element of the discussion um, in addition to um, ensuring that we have the right outreach for, for clinical trials. Wow, thank you so much, all three of you. I feel like I have goosebumps after hearing all three of you just give those last words. So thank you so much for being here today and thank you for enlightening all of us and being so knowledgeable on these topics and sharing all of that information with our viewers. Um, at this point, we are pretty much out of time. So I would just like to thank our panelists and to have you wave and say goodbye and you can turn off your videos for now. Thank you so much and um, of course, thank you to all of our viewers for all of your fantastic and thought-provoking questions. I would now like to welcome our president, Tim Ritchie, back on screen to say a few words of farewell before we really head out. Yes, thanks for joining us. We as a country are in trouble. We've had 500,000 people die of COVID, but this could be a real fine hour for us if we pull together and restore faith in medicine, restore faith in science, restore faith in institutions, restore faith in each other. At one level, vaccines don't matter.
vaccinations do. And that is our moment. This is our time to correct what was an avoidable error. So now we're gonna go into groups. Uh, Emily will tell you how we're gonna do that. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Take care. Thank you so much, Tim. And once a big, once again, a big thank you to our fantastic panelists. I'm giving you a round of applause, even though you can't quite hear it. I'd like to, um, now uh, we are going to uh, think a little bit about next month. So many of you joined us for our first vaccine event last month, and we're thrilled you were able to join us again tonight. The event, um, this event tonight is our second of three town halls in a series focused on vaccination decisions. Our next event will be on March 23rd, and we will discuss what our near future might look like post COVID-19. We are now going to stop streaming to Facebook and YouTube. So thank you all who joined us there and we will see you next time.